All my life, I've always thought I was an old soul. Ever since I was young, I have just felt that I had a sense of the gravity of the world, that you know, I was never concerned with the trifles of youth or you know, entertaining myself with little pleasures. I, I wanted to know how things worked. I wanted to know what drove people, and I think that's a, a trait that you tend to find in people who have been around a lot longer, just that desire to really understand things and people. How did you come to acting? I had had a series of relationships just continue to fail, and I took a really hard look at my life, and I realized... Um, so I, I'm a lawyer by trade, and I realized that I was so unhappy being a lawyer that I was putting all the pressure on my relationships to make me happy. And I'm sure anyone in a successful relationship knows that is not the way <laughs> to go about having a successful relationship. So I just really started thinking, you know, I need to change something, and I need to, you know, it's cliched, but, you know, we only have this one life, um, and what was I going to do with it? So I looked into acting. It was something I'd never really done unless you count a play I did in the sixth grade. But it was something, if we really listen sometimes to our instincts, I think I just had this feeling that I might like it and I might be good at it. And so I asked a friend of mine if I wanted to take an acting class, where would I go? And his answer still makes me laugh because I just knew so little. But he said, there's only one school, and that school is the Strasbourg School which anyone listening to this who's an actor will know is a hilarious simplification, and if anything, a very weird choice. But I took his word as gospel, so I applied to go to Strasbourg, and they let me in, and that was sort of the beginning of everything. What was the greatest challenge you had to cope with when you decided to become an actor? I think for me, the greatest challenge was overcoming the fear of it. You know, I came to acting arguably at a, a pretty late age. I started acting at 33. And there is an element of, of just sort of embarrassment. I remember even going to my first classes and being a little, I don't want to tell anyone my age. I mean, they were all in their 20s, a, a handful of people that were older. But, you know, just this feeling of, what am I doing? You know, it's too late for this. I'm too late. I missed the boat. It was all just fear. Fear of admitting to someone that I even wanted this. That felt foolish. Fear that I was going to fail at it. Fear that, I don't know, just that you'd have to explain to people why you were doing this weird thing when you had a, a successful career and all of these things. Um, so I would say that was the biggest challenge was just getting over that hurdle of saying, I'm choosing to do this thing despite being afraid. I don't think you can talk yourself out of fear, really. I think we try to do that. We try to talk ourselves out of fear, and usually very unsuccessfully. And I think the trick is just to have, a, I mean, for lack of a better word, faith, um, to take that step, to just show up. And I think you just at a certain point say, regardless of the outcome, I would rather look back and say, I tried this brave thing, even if you fail, than to have never tried at all. How do you prepare yourself when you have to perform a character? I think the only way to successfully play someone else is to allow you into the character. There's no way around that. If you try to hide who you are, either the performance or the character is going to feel flat. Uh, we have to bring our inner life to a character, and then we have to layer on top of that. But the absolute base of any character that's going to make anyone love them or want to watch them, you have to draw on who you are or you don't have that sort of the core of what makes something or someone worth watching. How do you learn your text when you have one to perform? I have a pretty specific ritual, which is going to sound a little crazy, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, so whenever I get a script, whether it's for class or an audition or an actual performance, I will read the script front to back, two or three times. I then record it, me recording all of the lines, and then I will listen to that while I'm saying the lines out loud. So I'm listening and saying it out loud. Then I'll just listen to it, and I'll sort of visualize the scene. 
And then after that, it is just you know paragraph by paragraph or line by line, just until I have it, then I move on. And then finally, I will write it all out by hand. Once or twice, depending how long it is, obviously a full play, it's kind of hard to write the whole thing out, although I've done that. Um, but again, breaking it into chunks, if it's really a big play um, or a big piece, that's sort of, I mean, really you just have to put the time in. Um, but it's also a muscle. I think the more you use the muscle of memorization, the easier it becomes. Do you learn something essential about you from your acting? I learn something about myself from every character I play, you know? Uh, and even thinking, thinking through different ways you can play the same character. And that always teaches you something about yourself, you know? And we think sometimes, too, about how we respond to the same situation differently given how our internal weather is on a given day, right? So if I've had a sad day or I've had a happy day and I take the same text, I'm going to respond differently in that situation. And it's allowing yourself to also sort of explore then what that means to be a person who isn't always going to have the same response on the same you know, to the same circumstance on a different day. And I think that's where I find the most growth is really allowing myself to say there isn't a right way to do this scene. There are many ways and I don't, let's play. And sometimes, you know, if I have a good scene partner, we'll play with that. Let's do this whole scene angry. Let's do this whole scene tender. Let's do this whole scene. And it is so fascinating what comes out of that. You know, some, you have moments where you'll just say, yes, that, that is right for this part. It's not right for any other part, but that was right for this section. That It just feels like that is what this character to bring to life needs to feel. Do you have this feeling of it's right for the character while playing or just afterwards? That is a great question. I think it is both, but the true awareness of it is only after. Um, if you're truly, I think, living a character, you're not super aware in the moment. It reaches this point of weightlessness almost and almost a dissociation from your body because you've become someone else. You're living, I mean, in real life, how often are we really taking a reading? It's only afterwards when we reflect upon it that we think, oh, that affected me in this way or I felt this way, but it's upon reflection that we learn that. And I think it's the same with acting. You can sort of be aware because you're always a little bit and sort of out of body when you're acting, you can sort of be aware, this is working. But it isn't until later that you can really understand why. What kind of risks do you like to take while playing? In an ideal situation where you have, you know, you're working on a script that really speaks to you and you're working with someone that brings out the best in you, which in my opinion is usually just someone you feel safe with. It doesn't even necessarily matter anything else but that and you're working with other people who trust you to deliver a story that they are going to be comfortable telling, that's when I think you can really play and really take risks. And I guess the short to your, <laughs> to your question is that trust and comfort is really what allows you to take risks, which is I think why people gravitate to doing movies with the same people, staying in the same acting classes, is there a clear line separating your daily life from your life on stage? For me, there is. And that is an important, that's actually an, a great question because it wasn't always that way. And I found when I studied that was actually something very dangerous about the work is, you know, they teach you to really draw on your life, your personal life in order to be these characters and to feel their pain. And they don't teach you very well how then to step back out of that. So, you know, I, my first six months of acting, I spent very sad, you know. Uh, so for me, as I then started studying other techniques and I realized, oh, there are so many other ways to bring a character to life that don't involve racking yourself with all these t horrible emotions and reliving these terrible events. You know, I found for me, I can just live as a character. If I really spend the time to understand what drives them, then I can step into that character, be that character, and then when I stop being that character, I'm me again. And it doesn't bleed over. And that is very important for me, personally, to have that separation between my acting life and my personal daily life. 
because I don't think it's tenable to really drag all of that stuff back into your personal life. It would really affect, I think, all of our relationships, as it did for me when I first started. I actually remember Kirsten Dunst saying at some point that she realized she didn't have to be sad in person in her real life to play a character who was sad. And that seems so, you know, mind-blowing, but it's not. You don't. You don't have to. You can be the happiest person in the world and still find the depths of sadness that a character needs to play, and I think it's important to separate them. Do you expect anything special from an encounter with another actor? Expect is different, I guess, than hope for. Um, I mean, what I'm hoping for is that every actor I work with will bear a little bit of themselves to me because that's what it really requires for two characters to live, to come to life, is for two people who are generally foreign to each other, sometimes have only met for the first time, be able to really look into the soul of the other person and you have to allow that. You know, you can look, but if someone isn't allowing it, then there's nothing you can do. And for anyone who's encountered this, you can tell. I mean, it is an instant thing. You can tell if someone's willing to let you in or not. And so that's what I hope for, is that someone will let me in and that they will treat with care when I let them in. I'm going to leave the space for five, six minutes. Keep the microphone and please... Add whatever you want to the interview. <laughs> That's just mean. Oh, okay. You're leaving. <laughs> I think the word selfish is really misused, and we use it when people, you know, engage in their own self-care, and I wish we didn't. I wish people thought it was okay to take care of themselves. I, I mean, it's a silly analogy, but when you're on a plane and they say, You know, if you're traveling with a child and the oxygen masks come down, put it over yourself before the child, because obviously if you pass out, you can't help them. Anyway, I say that, you know, to myself a lot. It's okay to refill my well, because if my well isn't full, then how can I help others refill theirs?